This is the Stephen A. Smith Show Podcast. I'm Stephen A. Welcome to the latest edition of the Stephen A. Smith Show. Coming at you as I love to do. Got a lot of stuff to get to today. Got some guy from Lithuania. Uh, some very, very incendiary comments about black folks. We'll talk about that today. We'll definitely get into some stuff in regards to Carmelo Anthony, in regards to Chris Paul, in regards to Jerry West being in Los Angeles with the Clippers, not the Lakers, and what that means potentially uh, for so many people. As we move forward, looking at what's going to take place in L.A., what's going to happen in the basketball landscape of things, interesting summer. In the City of Angels, no question about that. Lonzo Ball, we can't escape that subject matter. And we can't do it because Magic Johnson, Rob Palenka, and the Los Angeles Lakers have the number two overall pick in this year's NBA draft. And what they do with it will tell us an awful, awful lot about the direction this franchise is going in. And we can go from there. Number to call up, as always, is 866-729. That's 866 Let me get to something that's on my mind right now, because I know that we saw the Golden State Warriors celebrating a championship yesterday, a parade, the likes of which we haven't seen in Los Angeles uh, since, what is it, 2010. Haven't seen it in the city of New York for the Knicks, that is, since 1973. Don't even get me started with that. The Golden State Warriors were celebrating a championship yesterday, and obviously when folks speak, we're going to listen. And Draymond Green had something to say in regards to LeBron James, and then LeBron James had something to say as a retort to all of that. Before I even get into the back and forth between the two, let's listen to yesterday's championship parade, and in particular Draymond Green of the Golden State Warriors and what he had to say about the best player in the world, the one and only LeBron James. Listen up. Hey, can somebody give Bob some <laughs> credit? They want to talk about super teams, this, super team, that. I never played on a super team. You started the super team, bro. I ain't joining the super team. Hey, Slim, I don't know what you just did, Slim, but you did something to them boys. We appreciate you joining the super team. I, I never played on the super team. That's crazy. That was Draymond Green. We got that sound from LeBron on that podcast because it's LeBron, obviously, with Richard Jefferson and those boys on, um, what is it, Road Tripping Podcast. That's what it's called, Road Tripping. LeBron James obviously had a response to that. He had an Instagram photo, some music in the background looking like he decided to finally take himself bald and shave off his head, which, by the way, I applaud because he's brave because he's a hell of a lot braver than me because God knows I might need to go bald one day, but I don't have a big square head. I got a noggin in the back. I got a little a little egg head with a beak for a nose. I don't think I would look attractive bald at all because I'm damn near not that attractive now. But having said all of that, getting to the real substance of all of this, LeBron, Hearing what Draymond Green, not electing to disappear like he should since he just lost the championship three days ago, but instead tweeting and Instagramming back, having something to say to Draymond Green, he then decides to go on that road tripping podcast with his teammate Richard Jefferson. And listen to what LeBron James had to say. In 2003, the Lakers uh, combined Carl Malone, Gary Payton, Shaq, and Kobe. Mm-hmm. Super and, and, and 90 And 96... When Jordan was retired, the, the Rockets joined Charles Barkley, Akeem Olajuwon, and Clyde Drexler, all on the same team. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but I don't look at it as uh, I definitely didn't start the super team. Is that what he's trying to say? But I just feel like it's great that on the day that you're celebrating your championship, uh, my my uh, likeness and my name is in your head. Well, yeah, I, I, I love that. I'm not going to knock LeBron James for that last comment. You're a champion. You're the best in the world. You know they had to stack the deck in order to beat you. I get where he's coming from in regards to that, being still being in their head, et cetera, et cetera. But where LeBron James lost me was when he tried to compare what he did in going to Miami to what transpired with Clyde Drexler and Charles Barkley in Houston 
and Carl Malone and Gary Payton in L.A. See, that, that's where I get turned off. That's where he loses me. Let me be very, very clear. LeBron James moved to South Beach in no way should compare to what Kevin Durant did. The Miami Heat were not the Golden State Warriors. The Golden State Warriors were NBA champions who went back to the NBA Finals and lost in the Game 7 of that NBA Finals, primarily due to a suspension for Draymond Green that should have never happened as far as I'm concerned. Andre Iguodala, Sean Livingston, the Splash Brothers, and Klay Thompson and Steph Curry, along with Draymond Green, all were on those teams. And Kevin Durant joined them. One month after losing in Game 7 to them in a Western Conference Finals. That in no way compares or draws comparison to what LeBron James did. When LeBron James went to South Beach, he, D-Wade, Chris Bosh, none of them had ever played together. Matter of fact, I think the only people who had played together was Dwayne Wade with, uh, what is it, Joel Anthony? I think that's about it. Other than that, and maybe Mike Miller, that was about it. Not only that, They had been bounced out in the first round the previous year. So you had to develop and cultivate not only chemistry, but a culture. It was not the same. Not by any stretch. It was not the same. What Kevin Durant did, and I'm not going to be disrespectful to him, I promised a wonderful, lovely Mama Durant, I said I was sorry because she thought I was too harsh, and I'm not going to be that way. Because I love his mama. She's what a wonderful woman. But I will tell you this. The facts are the facts. They stacked the deck and he joined a well-oiled machine. That's not the same as LeBron. But what LeBron needs to understand is that what he did is not the same as what Barkley and those boys did. When Clyde Drexler joined the Houston Rockets, he was 32 and approaching the twilight of his career. He retired three years later. When Charles Barkley joined the Houston Rockets, he was 33 and fatter and was three years removed from retirement because he retired at 36. When Gary Payton joined the Lakers, he was 35 and was going to retire in a couple of years. Now, he ended up in Miami because they couldn't win a chip in L.A. because they had lost to Detroit, if I remember correctly. And then Carl Malone, when he arrived with Gary Payton to the Los Angeles Lakers, Carl Malone was 40 years old. 40. And he retired that year that they lost to the Pistons. Now look at LeBron. When he decided to leave Cleveland to go to Miami, he was in a prime of his career or even approaching his prime. He was 26. Kevin Durant approaching the prime of his career to leave the Golden State. He was 27. The two don't compare. Stop. Just stop it. So I'm not hating on anybody. LeBron is the greatest player in the world. Kevin Durant, as far as I'm concerned, is number two. And watching these two go against one another will be epic for years to come, I hope. But don't bring Carl Malone and Gary Payton and Charles Barkley and Clyde Drexler into the equation to justify your move from Cleveland to South Beach. There is no justification. There is no comparison, rather. I have no problem with LeBron going to Miami because, again, they never played together. Plus, there were some real issues in Cleveland. It ain't like he went to Boston to join KG, Ray Allen, Paul Pierce, and Rondo. He didn't do that. He went to Miami. And beat those guys. There's a difference. Kevin Durant didn't join somebody else to beat the Golden State Warriors after they knocked them out in Game 7 of the Western Conference Finals. He joined them. Now, again, going to be nice. He's a champion and an NBA Finals MVP and one of the top two players in the world. That's the only reason I get on him for that, because he's one of the greatest I've ever seen. His presence made it incredibly unfair because it dramatically shifted the balance of power. And that was proven not just through this regular season 
in which the Golden State Warriors won six sixty-seven games. And oh, by the way, they went on a 13-game winning streak without him because he was hurt. They also didn't lose a game in the playoffs until they lost game, game four of the NBA Finals. As far as I'm concerned, my point was proven. And it's been proven again just now. Want to be a part of this show? Hit Stephen A. up weekdays from 1 to 3 Eastern at 866-729-3776. You're listening to the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Wanted to get to another story, too. Um, and don't get me wrong, the Mayweather Conor McGregor story ain't going anywhere. No, re- no reason for me to bring that up. I'll take your calls on it, no problem. But we all know that Mayweather is the prohibitive favorite. Conor McGregor will be lucky to ha- land a shot on him. But if he does land a shot on him, what kind of an impact it will have? These are the kind of questions that you have. I don't believe anybody's a sucker for buying a fight as my colleague and friend uh, Dan Lebertard intimated. Because I think that even when people know the outcome, They still want to see the train wreck. That doesn't make them a sucker. You're only a sucker if you don't know or if you firmly believe you know what's going to happen and you couldn't be more wrong and that was your impetus for buying the fight. Like if you think Conor McGregor is going to knock Mayweather out only to watch Mayweather take him to school, okay, then maybe you're a sucker. But if you're interested in seeing Okay, when's Conor McGregor going to fall? Is he going to get knocked out? Or can he luck up and catch Floyd Money Mayweather with a punch? Can he get that lucky? And that's the intrigue. There's nothing wrong with that. But let me get back to this story. You're not going to hear me talking about a Lithuanian coach very often. <clears throat> but it's applicable here. I don't know how to pronounce his name, so I'll just take a guess at it. Gavitis Vainoskis president of Lithuanian professional basketball team, B.C. Liet, uh, Liet Tuvos, right? I guess he sparked controversy after attributing his team's struggles to having too many black players. According to FIBA.com, a writer for FIBA.com, Simonis Baranoskis. Listen to this quote, ladies and gentlemen. This is from uh, Gavitis. Vanoskis, the president of Lithuanian professional basketball, he said, quote, we've always held a stance that there shouldn't be more than two black players on the team. What happened was that coach Thomas Pekesis likes to play with black players to control them, to teach them, to tutor them. And we ended up with four players that are black. All of a sudden they came together to form. How should I put it? A sort of a game. It cannot be that way. No more than two black players. I can say that from my 23 years of experience in the business. Teams don't ever have more than two black players. Smiles. Because that's when bad things start to take place. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, let me say this to you. That is a completely and utterly racist comment. By this no good SOB of a coach, of a, of a president for a professional basketball league. How many black players are on Golden State? How many black players are on the Cleveland Cavaliers led by LeBron James? How many black players are on the Boston Celtics who are in the conference finals? What about the San Antonio Spurs? What about James Harden, the league MVP candidate? What about Russell Westbrook, a league MVP candidate? That is an utterly racist comment. That's number one. Number two. Do you really expect me to sound surprised? Because you see what this coach revealed were a couple of things. Number one, racism is not just a national issue. It's a global issue. It's one of the reasons why people in America who do feel that way feel victimized themselves when they're called to the carpets for it because they're literally ready to proclaim, look, we're not the only ones feel this way. Anybody feels this way. And they're able to point to different parts of this world. And the isms or the isms that they exercise and they say, see, we're not alone. That's one of the things to point to. The other thing to point to is that being black is a full-time job. It's another full-time job because whether you want to believe it or not, 
When you're black, you wake up every day with the odds stacked against you. We want to talk about the world, particularly the United States of America, being a a gorgeous mosaic, so inclusive and inclusionary. We want to act like there's no proverbial and figurative glass ceilings. That fair is not a place where they judge pigs, but it does actually exist. And as a result, because of the advancements that have taken place in our society, you know what? Hey, problems, not what they seem. And then you look at a guy like LeBron James, who has racial epithets spray painted on his gate in Brentwood, California. And you realize and recognize that it's very, very real because if LeBron James could be subjected to it, an iconic global brand of a superstar athlete who's worth close to a billion dollars. If he has to deal with this, if he has to deal with this, think about what you got in store for yourself. Think about what you have to deal with. The average Joe, the average black dude out there working a nine to five and black women, by the way, because they got it rough, too. What's the other issue that this Lithuanian president of basketball uh, speaks to? I'll tell you what it does. I'll tell you what his quote speaks to. It also speaks to remember what he used the word control. Because you see, one of the things that black folks lament Amongst ourselves, it's just a reality that we face. Is that far more often than not, if a white counterpart with equal talent, equal cachet, equal in every way imaginable, they simply wouldn't have to go through what we have to go through. The floodgates would open for them. But when you're black, the objective, first and foremost, always appears to be control. Let's control this individual. Let's keep him in line or her in line, primarily him. Let's make sure we can control and monitor things. There isn't a black man alive that would disagree with what I just said. Not one unless they were looking to make publicity for themselves by creating headlines, lying about their emotions, because I think that I speak universally when I say that last part. When you are black, particularly a man, and you have talent, and you are a moneymaker, and you are productive, the issue of control usually appears to be a huge agenda concerning you. Why do you think LeBron James goes about the business so diligently of being his own boss and controlling his own destiny? Why do you think Floyd Money Mayweather can't shut up to save his life about how he's the boss? He talks about that more than he talks about his money. Because if you are a black man anywhere in this world, your number one aspiration is something that is close to impossible for 99.9% of us. And that is control of our own destiny. Control of our own lives. Because more than forfeiting dollars and cents The number one thing, the establishment, apparently globally, seems hell bent on exercising. Is making sure that they relinquish anything. Before they relinquish control. Of a black man. To that black man. There isn't a black person alive that would disagree with what I just said if they're truly honest with themselves and you. Trust me on that. Lithuanian president of the Basketball League, it's sad to hear him say what he said 
clearly very, very racist. Sadder, however, is the fact that if you're black, statement didn't shock you at all. At least not how he felt. Possibly only that he was stupid enough to express it publicly. Guess what? You're in the middle of the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Damn it, I mean it! Let's go to Bradley in Dix Hills. You're live with Stephen A. Talk to me, Bradley. Hey, Stephen A. How you doing? I'm all right. Thank you for calling. What's up? I just want to make a comment on what this Lithuanian coach said. I think it's totally ignorant. Um, growing up, I'm from a predominantly African-American area in, uh, in Queens. I played high school ball for Coach Jack Kern at Archbishop Malloy. So our team was pretty mixed. Kenny Anderson, Kenny Smith. Yes, go yep. ahead. Great alumni right there. Yep. Um, but our team was mixed. You know, we had about like eight or nine black players and about four or five white players. And if that doesn't teach you that it doesn't matter what race you are, you're going to come together as one team. If you've got a great coach who can make all those guys play together, I don't care who he's playing, who you're playing for, you're going to have the, you're going to become a good team. You're going to play the, the game the right way. It doesn't matter who you are because, in all honesty, growing up, I played an AAU ball out there too. You know, I played against white teams that, that tried to play one-on-one basketball. And I know that stigma is always put on black players over white players, but I just don't see that. I just think it has to do with who's teaching you how to play the game instead of who you are as an individual. And that goes to Wilmont's point yesterday as well when he was talking about how, you know, his son and his team, they're trying to emulate what the Warriors and Curry are doing. Look, in the early 2000s when I was playing ball, everybody tried to emulate AI. I don't care who you were. AI was a great player, but he bought a one-on-one brand of basketball. So it doesn't matter what race. Everybody's going to do what they we think. We got your like. point. We got your point. I appreciate the call, Bradley. Thank you so much. Appreciate you for enlightening us all because you're absolutely right. Let's go to Jared. You're live with Stephen A. on ESPN Radio. What's up, Jared? Hey, what's up, Stephen A.? I want to talk about the the NBA draft. Go ahead. I feel like the Celtics are on the fence on what they're going to do. There's a report that they're taking Josh Jackson, but do they appear to be on the, the they, they appear to be on the fence because a lot of people have been saying, you know, y'all talk about Markel Fultz at number one, Fultz at number one, and Lonzo Ball at number two. Y'all do know the best person and the best player in the draft is Josh Jackson, right? That's what a lot of yes, these sir. guys are hearing. That's where the hesitation comes from. Yeah, I, I think they should take him, but it's going to be interesting. Take hope. To, take hope. If, if the Lakers fall to Fultz, that'd be crazy if they take Fultz instead of Ball. But yeah, <laughs> my man, my man, you, you're not listening to me. I asked you a question. Who are you talking about? Should take who? I think that the Celtics should take Josh Jackson. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. What about uh? What, you know what, what? What about this kid? What about this kid Brown? I mean, what, what about Jalen? What about Jalen Brown? How about him? Uh, I think he should stick on the bench for now. I think he should keep developing, developing in a player, and I think you you can plug in Josh Jackson with the Celtics, you know, in the starting All right. lineup. All right, appreciate the call, yeah. man. Thank you so much. Let's go to Tom in West Orange, live with Stephen A. What's up, Tom? Hey, first of all, uh, uh, good afternoon, Stephen A. How are you? I'll make it real quick. First of all, I want to thank you for the Lithuanian. I saw your show this morning. You and Max are spot on, and I like the way you took Max uh, back. Like I spoke to you last week, I'm the same dude that spoke to you last week, and what did I tell you? LeBron, speak up for the average dude, and you said that too. You speak up for the average black person, and that's what you said on your show too. One more thing I'd like to say, um, what, do you, what do you think about um, the Mayweather? Now, I'm going to tell you one thing I'll be real, real quick because I'm a senior citizen. Okay. So I'll go way back with, 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 um, with Will. I'll go back with Elgin Bell. I'll go back with all of those guys. But let's say for boxing now, I go back when Muhammad Ali, when he was at his prime, okay. when he was the best. Okay, what I want to say real quick, there's only three fighters that i ever seen that could hit somebody uh, going backwards. Now, I've seen Muhammad Ali do it quite a few times when he was in his prime, okay? I didn't, see, um, I didn't see Sugar Ray Robinson do it exactly, but I went online and saw his fights. He could do it. Now they're saying this guy McGregor could do it too. Now you gave him only a 1% chance on your show this morning. That is correct. But I tell you what, if you can hit somebody going backwards with both hands, Stephen A., you better give him a little bit more than 1%. I'm no, I'm not going to give him. I'm That's not going I'm, I'm to give him more than 100, 1%, and here's why. Because the only chance I'm giving him is a puncher's chance. I respect where you're coming from. See, when you look at other people, but here's the thing. When you look at other people who fight, 
what you're assuming is that they're superior boxers, they're superior fighters, plus they can take a punch, blah, 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 blah. Here's my thing with Mayweather. The greatest boxers in the world couldn't touch him. Meaning, like, literally, have they, they, they don't connect. Like, who would have ever thought that Pacquiao would miss more than 300 times? Who would have ever thought that? How about Canelo? Right? Well, How about wait, Canelo? Wait, wait, remember, remember, Canelo was raw. Canelo's a power puncher. He's good and he's fast, but not Pacquiao fast. And he certainly didn't have Pacquiao's experience. So what I'm saying to you, for Pacquiao with that speed and that experience to literally miss Mayweather over 300 times, what does that tell you? He only, he only landed 21%. Pacquiao only landed 21% in that fight. It's unreal. Yeah. Yeah. It's unreal. Yeah. And that's yeah. what I'm saying. All yeah. right? So I don't give him a Gregor more than 1% of a chance, but I will respect him enough to give him at least a 1% chance. That's just where I'm at. We got a former Super Bowl champion partnering with Kings Ford Charcoal on a mission to make barbecue ribs the official food of America. We're approaching Father's Day. It's another reason why this next guest is here. His name is Vince Wolferk. Used to be the man with the New England Patriots, Tom Brady and the crew. Played for the Houston Texans over the last couple of years. He's a free agent now. We'll talk to him about himself and about what he's doing as Father's Day weekend approaches. Vince Wolfork, up next with Stephen A. on ESPN Radio. Give Stephen A. a piece of your mind. He is sorry. Call him weekdays from 1 to 3 Eastern. I mean, just trash. At 866-729-3776. Guess what? You're in the middle of the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Damn it, I mean it. Wolfork is running a little bit late, just a minute or so. Remember, Sunday is Father's Day. So Vince wants to make sure dads get the meal they deserve. Barbecue ribs. Hashtag stand with ribs. If you saw him on Twitter or his Facebook page, dancing to his barbecue ribs, you got to check it out. It's actually must watch. No question. But until he gets here, I'll get back to the phone calls. The second he comes, I will interrupt you and cut you off, though, just so you know. Let's go back to the phones at 866-729-ESPN. Let's go to Chris and Patterson. You're live with Stephen A. What's up, Chris? Hey, Stephen A. Hey. How you doing today, I'm buddy? Great. I'm good. Go ahead, buddy. Uh, what I want to talk about is the Mayweather and McGregor fight and why I think that it's it's it makes no sense to fight because it's like taking, um, let's just say, for instance, take Bryce Harper and put him in to score a touchdown on Richard Sherman. It's not going to happen. It's two different complete skill sets. I understand they're both great fighters and what they do but you're talking about you're not talking about well let's, uh, move, let's, move, let, let, let's move beyond that chris because it's gonna happen here's the question are you gonna pay to watch it of course i am i have something <laughs> i have to watch because it's, it's no matter who may win the fight i'm gonna you pay to what, watch chris? it it's, you know what chris i got love for you bro i got love for you because listen you called up to say it makes no sense whatsoever and then admit it you're gonna pay to watch it i give you credit for I, that that's of course honest. I am. I mean, you know, I'm not. I'm not gonna lie. I'm not. I'm not gonna lie and say I'm not gonna watch the fight. I'm gonna watch the fight. Chris, that's and the only right, reason man. I'm gonna watch it. Chris, I gotta. To Chris, I gotta interrupt you because Vince Wilfork is on the line with us right now, man. Chris, I'm sorry. Call back and I'll put you back on. But thank you so much for the call, buddy. Vince Wilfork, two-time Super Bowl champion with the New England Patriots. Obviously played the last couple of years with the Houston Texans. Free agent right now. One of the best guys you could ever know. What's going on, big boy? How are you, man? How's everything, man? I'm chilling, man. Just eating up some ribs and just enjoying life. <laughs> I hear you. I, I I ain't mad at you about that. Just so everybody know, the man Vince Wolf is on the line with me right now. He's partnering with Kings Ford Charcoal on a mission to make barbecue ribs, the official food of America. Like I told you, if you haven't seen the video of Vince dancing to his barbecue ribs, go check it out on Vince's Facebook page or Twitter account at Wolfrick number seventy five. Obviously, it's much watch. Talk to me about. Uh, you know, when, when you think about yourself right now, uh, you're a free agent. How are you feeling about that? You've you've hinted at retirement. You're going to retire. You're going to come back next year. What you going to do? Well, you know, right now I'm just relaxing and just enjoying my time uh, being off. You know, I haven't had I haven't had this time in 20 years because of playing football. Mm. So uh, I don't. I'm not. I'm not committed to being retired. I'm not committed to say I'm playing. I just want to make sure 
when I do make that decision, it's, it's the right decision because retirement, that's a big step. You know, that's a big step. And that's something that nobody can tell me to go play or, or retire. That's going to be something that I'm 100% going to, going to decide on my own. Um, to continue to play or not continue to play. And right now, I'm just sitting back and enjoying time off and just doing things differently now, you know, that I'm in June that I've never done in 20 years. So um, that's, you know, until until I know what I'm doing, I'm going to continue to wake up every day and move the way I move, go go hit golf balls, go fish. And, dan- go and, dance, in front, and dance in front of the grill while you're making the barbecue ribs. Tell it like it is. Exactly. And, and, and dance and, and and get down with my barbecue ribs, me and Kingsford. Long burning charcoal, baby. Now, here's the thing, because uh, you know you hear a lot of people in the world of football in this day and age, Vince, they talk about stepping away from the game because of fears of being unhealthy when it's all over. That doesn't seem to be a concern of yours. You just seem to be concerned about enjoying life and whatever's going to happen happens, but you don't seem to be worried about playing again due to injuries or anything. Is that an accurate assertion to make? Yeah, I never played the game thinking about any type of injuries. You know, I've been playing ball for 20 years, total in my life, and I had one major injury. So you can talk to anybody that's been playing ball as long as I've been playing and ask him have, how many injuries you have. And I'm I'm lucky and blessed to be sitting here saying I only had one major injury. So I never thought about being injured or going out there getting hurt or what happened. You know, I'm more concerned about, A, me being able to walk away from the game and not having the game take me away from it because of I can't do it anymore or whatever it may be. So and, and and that's my main concern. So whatever happens, I'm a true believer in. You know, when I was a kid and I signed up to play football, I knew everything about football. I knew the collision, how violent it was. I knew it. I accepted that. So and I'm blessed to be sitting here in my right mind, healthy. So, as long as I'm that, I'm good. Vince, before I let you go, one quick last question about this uh, because we got to get we got a hard break coming up. It sounds to me okay. like if anyone, if anybody calls you, uh, you might think about it. But if the New England Patriots call you, who you won two Super Bowls with, the boys Bill Belichick and Tom Brady picked up the phone. I, I, I think that Vince Vince Wolf will, will be quick. You know, will we'll head on back to Foxborough <laughs> quick, fast, and in a hurry. Am I wrong in assuming that, bro? Well, I tell you what, I did spend 11 years with two Super Bowls up there, so you do the math. Say no more. <laughs> Say no more. Vince, Vince Wolfert partnering partnering with Kings Ford Charcoal on a mission to make barbecue ribs the official food of America. Big boy, always great talking to you, man. Thanks for calling in. All Pleasure. the best to you, man. All up. I'll see you in New England. I'll see you in New England. I just suspect, <laughs> I just suspect that, Vince. I just suspect that. Thanks a lot, bro. <laughs> the one and only Vince Wolfock right here with Stephen A. on ESPN Radio. You heard him. The two Super Bowls. He said, you do the math. I played there for 11 years, won two Super Bowls. You do the math. You heard what he said. So that means if you're Robert Kraft, if you're Bill Belichick, if you're Tom Brady, pick up the phone and call Vince, and he's coming back to Foxborough. So I guess I, I expect him to be in Foxborough because why in God's name would you not want to have Vince Wolfock on your squad? I don't understand it. Don't, I, don't, I don't see the problem. Bill Belichick, Robert Kraft, call your boy. He's willing to come back to Foxborough. Houston, I like you, Bill O'Brien. I love you, Rick Smith. You know that. But they ain't the New England Patriots. I'm just saying. That's just a sample of what you'll hear on the Stephen A. Smith Show. Weekdays at 1 p.m. Eastern on Sirius XM Channel 80 and the ESPN app. This this is the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. I'm Stephen A. Hour number two of the Stephen A. Smith Show here with you. So some woman wants to run. Some woman wants to be a cop in Jersey, in New Jersey. And apparently they found out a few weeks ago that she had a background as a dominatrix. From 2010 to 2012. And here is the front page of the New York Post. Beat cop. (laughs) And it says, at least she has her own handcuffs. (laughs) That's a good one. I got to admit it. And then if you read the story on page 7 of the New York Post, the lead of the show. First of all, the, the title of the article is Whip and Chain of Command. Okay. 
And then it says, first sentence, she wants to spend her life using handcuffs. A New Jersey sheriff's officer is undergoing a legal spanking after her boss has found out that she once worked as a dominatrix and tried to boot her out of the department. Her name is Kristen Hyman, who was recently sworn in as a member of the Hudson County Sheriff's Office, is facing a disciplinary hearing where she will have to fight for her career because against claims that her status as an ex-whip mistress disgraces the organization, the Jersey Journal reported. The trouble started last month when just six days before Hyman was to graduate from the police academy when her bosses became aware that she held the kinky job between 2010 and 2012 and had even made some steamy R-rated bondage videos. I won't really get any more than that. Let the lady be a cop, please. I mean, the headline is funny. Everything's funny. But bottom line is, is that, you know, now she wants to be an officer. She sworn up uphold to protect and to serve. Let her protect and serve. I mean, my goodness. I tell you, folks try to find every, any, every and any reason under the sun to keep you out of a damn job these days. It's unbelievable. Unbelievable. Anyway, somebody's not going to have a problem finding the job is going to be Lonzo Ball. Because obviously he's getting ready to be one of the, getting ready to be one of the top five picks in uh, this next week's next Thursday's upcoming NBA draft. As a result, there's speculation as to what may transpire. One minute you're hearing the Boston Celtics may take Markel Fultz out of Washington. Another minute you're hearing now that so, who some deem to be the best player in the draft, Josh Jackson out of Kansas, he'll go number one. But then we're talking about Danny Ainge here with the Boston Celtics, who could be fooling everybody and might end up picking Lonzo Ball just to mess with the Lakers or trading the pick or trading down. So somebody else could trade up. You just never know. You just never know. What I will say is this, and I said this yesterday. I don't want to see or hear from anybody Thursday night for the draft other than Magic Johnson out of the Los Angeles Lakers. I don't want to see anybody else. I really, really don't. And the reason I don't want to see anybody else is because this is his pick, man. This man is the basketball savant. This man, this man that is Magic Johnson, has to be the one to make this pick. Because it's the only reason we'll have any confidence in it if we're rooting for the Lakers. It's the only reason. It's the only reason. And so for me, Magic's got to be the one to make this call. And I'll tell you something else that's going on in Los Angeles that y'all also need to pay attention to. This move by the Clippers to bring on Jerry West was brilliant. Because as much as we love Doc Rivers, and I love me some Doc Rivers, I just think that dual responsibilities as president of basketball operations, along with head coach, is too much. I think he should be focused on the coaching. And I think that somebody else should have significant say on formulating a roster for Doc Rivers to work with. And I can't think of anybody better than Jerry West. And his son, who works for the Lakers, get him the hell out of there. He don't need to be up in there. If the Lakers wanted him, he would have been the GM instead of Rob Palenka. Get him out of there. Let him go to the Clippers. Let him work under his daddy. Because he's got great potential, and Jerry West is the man. As an executive, most of what he has touched has turned to gold. Leave that man alone. I don't give a damn whether he's the GM, he's the consultant, he's the president of basketball operations. I don't give a damn what his title is. Just make sure that when it's time to make a decision, Jerry West is a significant part of that decision-making process. So all I care about, He's Jerry West. And by the way, you need him now more than ever because if Chris Paul is truly and legitimately entertaining, departing for the Los Angeles Clippers, especially for the likes of the San Antonio Spurs, you have got yourself a problem. Let me tell you something right now. Chris Paul leaving is bad enough. Leaving you high and dry for nothing is even worse. You don't get Chris Paul's every day of the week. You got to keep him. Well, you got to make sure you get equitable compensation for him. If I'm going to lose Chris Paul, 
I'm calling the Cleveland Cavaliers and I'm trying to get Kyrie Irving for them. That's what I'm doing if I am the Los Angeles Clippers. That's what I'm doing. I can't afford to lose Chris Paul for nothing. Can't do it. Cannot do it. Jerry West knows this. So does everybody else, including Doc Rivers. Can't lose Chris Paul for nothing. That's a disaster. Now, me personally, I'm not as sold on Blake Griffin as everybody else. If I'm the Clippers, I'm making a call to the Indiana Pacers because all of this noise about Paul George coming to the Lakers, well, hell, what if I'm Jerry West and I'm Doc Rivers and I got DeAndre Jordan and Chris Paul and I say, Paul George, you want to come here instead of the Lakers? You trying to tell me Paul George wouldn't consider it? I think he would. Not that he has to say because Indiana has his rights and they'd have to be willing to trade him. But you understand my point. Can't lose Chris Paul for nothing. And by the way, I talked about this on First Take this morning on ESPN where I show up every weekday morning with my man Max Kellerman and Molly Carroll. I got to tell y'all something. I am a huge Chris Paul fan. I think he's a star. I think he's big time. I think as a floor general He's arguably the best in the NBA. Shot 41% from three-point range. Wasn't shabby. But I got to tell you something. When I watch this guy, as great as I know he is, he's never played in the conference finals. He's never played in an NBA finals. You got people looking at James Harden, Russell Westbrook, Steph Curry, and others and saying they all got better. Chris Paul did it. Well, when you're close to perfection as a point guard, that would explain why you haven't got but so much better. There's not but so much room to grow. But the flip side to all of it is, what has it parlayed into in terms of success? The answer would be not much. And as a result of that reality, I have to entertain alternatives. Now, do I move Chris Paul? No, but no one else is safe. No one else. I wouldn't move DeAndre Jordan either, personally. The man's a skywalker, and he's a legit 7 feet, seven one. He can block shots, he can rebound, and he catches alley-oops better than anybody in the game. But if it's me, I'm moving Blake Griffin. Because I think the Blake Griffin CP3 experiment has gone on long enough. And now, rather than Blake Griffin at the power forward spot, what I'm going to do is get a guy like Paul George instead. Because I could could utilize those talents for the better. With Chris Paul as my point guard. Yes, I can. I'd much rather see Paul George dribbling and shooting jump shots than Blake Griffin. I can tell you that much. So all of those things are something worth considering. Catch the Stephen A. Smith Show live on 98.7 ESPN New York, ESPN LA 710, and Sirius XM Channel 80. You just can't make this stuff up. Weekdays from 1 to 3 Eastern. You're listening to the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Needless to say, Conor McGregor, Floyd Money Mayweather isn't anticipated to be that close. Max Kellerman, my boy, predicted that Conor McGregor will not even touch Floyd. Dana White for the UFC obviously feels otherwise. He doesn't believe that, you know, that, that he didn't believe that the fight should ever happen, but Connor convinced him to make it happen. And Connor wants Floyd, and he thinks he can take him. And with the 10-ounce gloves and what have you, Connor's of the belief that he's going to be able to walk right through Floyd, and he'll be able to stalk him. Thing is, Floyd's accustomed to going 12 rounds. Connor ain't even accustomed to going five. So it's going to be real interesting to see what happens. We shall see. 866-729-ESPN. That's 866-729-3776. Alex and Bayshore, you're live with Stephen A. What's up? Hey, how you doing, Stephen A.? I'm first good. time caller. Talk to Love me. the show. Thank you. Love um, first take as well. Thank you. Uh, just a couple of questions about boxing. I I personally feel that boxing, I mean, uh, McGregor and Mayweather is a good fight. Just to expand the brand of boxing, bring some more UFC fans into it. Uh, what do you think about that? And also, um, tonight, uh, ne- tomorrow night's fight, that's also going to be a great fight. I got Ward winning as well, most likely by decision. I don't see him knocking out Kovalev or anything like that. But Kovalev is an awesome talent. and uh, I'll be I proud of Kovalev. I'll fight. be proud of Ward if he survives. 
I ain't gonna lie to you. Kovalev scares the living hell out of me. I agree. He he's a definitely a strong puncher, but I think Ward is a master a at master. distance. So he's a master. He definitely has an Let advantage. Let me tell you what that. this fight got me thinking about, Alex. What's that? This kid, Adonis Stevenson. Mm-hmm. I lost all respect I, for him. All respect. I was thinking the same because thing because he it's like, he refused to fight Kovalev because he knows the the, the risk. At, at I'm just saying, man, you can't. Kovalev. I mean, but he didn't fight anybody because he wouldn't fight Kovalev. I mean, come <laughs> on, man. Come on. I agree. Oh, my goodness. But listen, also, I, I, think, uh, I think to answer your uh, question, I just think that Floyd is such a magician defensively. Like, if Floyd was a big-time offensive fighter but not so much defense, I would, I would, be, I would be more worried. But for Floyd, he's such a defensive magician. I just don't see how Connor's going to touch him unless he cheats, like, El, you know, clutches him and hugs him and elbows him. I don't see how he's going to touch Floyd. Because I'm a huge Floyd fan. I, As far as boxing, personal, I don't. that's none of my business. But as far as boxing, I love his work in there. Some people don't appreciate what he does because they think, oh, he's just tapping and running. I'm like, you got to understand, this is hard to do. There's people that try to do this and are very unsuccessful. You know, and Floyd is just a, a, a magician with it, like you well, said. Well, I got you, and I appreciate the call, Alex, but ain't too many dudes tried to box. You have boxers trying to fight in the UFC, but you haven't seen too many UFC dudes trying to box. This would be a first, at least one that I can recall. But we'll see what happens. Let's go to Mustafa. You're live with Stephen A. What's up, man? I'm doing good, brother. I hope you have a great Father's Day, okay? I know your family's been through a lot, and I hope all you guys are doing great and staying strong, you know? Thank you, man. For your mom. Thank you, bro. But. Go ahead. But, uh, you know, I don't watch boxing as much as I used to, but I watch the big-time fights. And I'm going to uh, comment quickly on this uh, Kovalev versus Ward fight. Kovalev is going to knock him out, man. I'm going to say this right here on National Airwaves. He's going to knock Andre Ward out. I know Andre Ward is a great fighter, but you should be worried because Kovalev should have won the last fight, as he mentioned. He's coming for blood. He's coming for vengeance. And he's coming for what's rightfully his. You know, you know what, so, I get what you're saying, but I, I got to tell you something, man. I've seen Andre Ward go into the ring with fighters who were supposed to be bigger and stronger, and he's picked them apart. He really, really has. And I don't think we has, can ignore that. But that that power, I mean, I'm itching for a knockout there, Stephen A. I really am. I mean, I don't see knockouts as much as I used to. I mean, George Foreman, my favorite all-time boxer, when he punched somebody, your whole body would vibrate. You know what I mean? So it's, it's, it's going to be a great fight to watch, but we'll see what happens. But this Conor McGregor-Floyd Mayweather fight, it, I, I'll, I'll use a basketball analogy, okay? It's like the Golden State Warriors playing the Brooklyn Nets in a seven-game series. We all know what's going to happen. But it's the intrigue. It's the entertainment spectacle. It's the pre-fight. It's the press conferences. It's the weigh-ins. It's the talk and smack on social media and beyond. It's all, all of these things, you know. That's what attracts people to this fight. You know what I mean? And... Floyd, I mean, I, 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 hope, I hope Dana White is, is right in saying that he may be able to catch him one time to make him more entertaining. But I think all the stuff that happens before the fight is going to be more entertaining than the fight itself. I got you. I appreciate the call. Thank you so much. And you're probably right about that. Uh, but listen, the hype makes fights. Hypes get, hype, you know, hype gets us interested in it. Okay, so we can't even listen as long as it's a real fight as opposed to hugging and, and kissing and nobody swinging. I mean, we're good. No matter what the results are, if Marvin Lewis, Marvin Hagler, and Tommy Hitman Hearns had ended the fight in the first round, wouldn't we have still been happy? Did any of us really complain when Peter McNeely got knocked out by Mike Tyson when he stormed out of the corner and was swinging on Mike Tyson, shocked the living hell out of Tyson before Tyson dropped him, and then he got up and ran around the ring? <laughs> I mean, what a moment that was! It was hilarious. But Peter McNeely almost got himself hurt. I thought the trainer stepped in at the right time and stopped that fight. Let's go to Larry in Fresno. You're live with Stephen A. What's up, Larry? How you doing, Stephen A? I just had a real quick question. Go ahead, bro. What do you think about uh, Chris Paul going back to New Orleans to join uh, Evans and Boogie? I don't think I don't think he would. I, I mean, I, I mean, I've thought about that. I just don't listen. We talk about Boogie Cousins. Boogie Cousins, big time, and we all know that Anthony Davis is a superstar in the making. There's no question about that, but. The flip side to it is that, don't get me wrong, I'm not going to rule out anything, but the flip side to it is that, you know, 
I, I think that Chris Paul isn't looking to develop anything. I think Chris Paul wants a championship as soon as he possibly can. I think he's looking at his own basketball mortality, and he wants to find himself in an immediate championship situation. That's what I think Chris Paul wants, and I think that's what he's after right now. Yeah, that makes sense. All right? Appreciate the call, right. man. Thank you so much. Let's go to Marcus in Jersey City. You're live with Stephen A. What's up, Marcus? My buddy. I miss you, man. Thank you, bro. Thank you. Uh, quick quick question. If you're the Lakers, what do you do with this draft pick? Do you trade the pick to go after Paul George, or do you go after one of those guys? One of like what Lonzo guys? Ball, Markel, like Lonzo Ball, Markel Fultz. Uh, uh, if I'm the Lakers, Jackson. I'm not trading the pick. Because I don't have anything. I need to have something to build the foundation of my franchise upon. I don't have anything right now. Now, if I'm I'm the Clippers and I need something tweaked to legitimately compete for a title, then I could trade picks. But if I'm the Los Angeles Lakers, I'm not doing that because what do I have? I don't have anything anyway. I'm just not going that route. I'm not trading that pick if I'm the Lakers. I'm just not doing it. Right. Uh, have a great right. father's day. You do the same, buddy. You do the same. Joshua and Elizabeth, you're live with Stephen A. What's up? What's going on, Stephen A.? How you feeling? I'm good. Talk to me. All right, so I just had a quick question. You were talking about uh, possibly the Cavs trying to trade for Chris Paul earlier? No, no, no. What I, was, no I wasn't saying they were trying to. What I was saying is if I'm the Clippers, rather than lose Chris Paul for nothing, I would pick up the phone and try to call the Cavs and try to get my hands on a guy like Kyrie for Chris Paul. Chris Paul, you got to remember, is best friends and the godfather to LeBron James' children. And so because of their close relationship, combined with Chris Paul's greatness as a playmaker and a point guard, which is something that the Cavaliers need, meaning a playmaker, and considering that he's running out of time in terms of competing for a championship, if I'm the Clippers and I know that Chris Paul is about to walk out on me, I'm going to try to make a call to some place like Cleveland so I can get some compensation. Yeah, I understand. But I don't think they would trade, you know, Uncle Drew at, what, 20 20- Six, maybe, for a 32-year-old Chris Paul. I just Absolutely. No, no, no. I'm saying you don't want to do it if you're Cleveland, but then you also have to look at it this way. Cleveland is going after the window of opportunity it has to win another championship for the city. They know that when LeBron leaves, they got to rebuild anyway. And so they made aspire to rebuild from scratch. You see what I'm saying? Because when it's time for Kyrie, he may be looking to leave too because he will have done all he could do in Cleveland. You understand what I'm saying? You got to remember, Kyrie is somebody that wants to go to the L.A. or the New York market. He wants to be in a big city. It's just that playing alongside LeBron, that's not an opportunity you pass up at this particular moment in time because you're competing for championship. But once the dominoes fall, they all fall. If LeBron leaves, Kyrie's going to be looking to leave too. And that's why you do something like that if you have the opportunity to do so if you're Cleveland because you're looking to move anyway. Uh, all right, I understand. One more thing, uh, Cowboys Nation all day, you already know that. Well, yeah, I don't know that. You yeah, know, that. know that. Let me ask you I a think, question. I think you're an undercover fan. but I'm, 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 You can believe that all you want to. You're going to get your feelings, or you keep believing that nonsense? Oh, we're coming, we're listen, coming. You listen, already listen, know we're coming. Let me, tell, let me ask you this question as a Cowboy fan, because all of y'all make me sick to my stomach. I can't stand Cowboy fans. Y'all are the worst. Here's the deal. Let me ask you this question, Joshua. Tell the truth. What time? Now, stay with me, okay? What time of the day did the Dallas Cowboys lose to the Green Bay Packers in the playoffs? I mean, let me let me tell you this. No, 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 no. No, no, no. Answer my question. Answer, I'm going to hang up. I'm going to hang up. If you don't answer my question, I'm going to hang up. What time of the day did they lose to the Green Bay Packers? Uh, man. Like, like 7 o'clock, right? Because it was a 4 yeah, o'clock game. like that. It was a 4 o'clock game, right? Like 7 o'clock. Now, how long was it? How long was it? Before you were saying, you know, we're going to win the Super Bowl next year. Tell the truth. Uh, honestly, I didn't think we was going to win the Super Bowl this year because I thought we was going to run into the conference, cha- you know, the, 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 the Super Bowl champions. And they were going right, to uh, they hold, are hold, a better hold, team. Hold, hold, hold. You're a Cowboy fan. I'm going to give you one more, time, one more chance to be honest. One more chance. One more chance. How yeah, much I'm a, time? I'm a real how much honest. time? How much time passed before you was talking about how y'all going to win next year? I'm going to say 2014, that year that we're, you know, and the, the catch with Dez, that was the year I felt, you know, we was, we, we was there. We was going to win. All right, man. Have a nice day, man.
ESPN. It's 866-729-3776. Cowboy fans are liars too, y'all. Not all. Some of them, like Joshua, might be real. But most Cowboy fans are liars. They won't admit who they are. Okay? What they'll do is they they, they brag all year. You know, you're going to win the Super Bowl. What? They could go 3-13 and, 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 and end the regular season on a Sunday, Monday morning. You know we're going to win the Super Bowl, right? I just can't stand Cowboy. I just can't stand Cowboy fans. They make me so sick. Oh, I can't stand them. It's not even the Cowboys I hate. It's their fans. They're the worst. Totally delusional. But then again, maybe I should love them. After all, what's better than watching delusional fans go on for 22 years and counting? <laughs> Guess what? You're in the middle of the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Damn it, I mean it! Corey, you're live with Stephen A. What's up, man? Hey, what's going on, Stephen A.? Talk to me, bro. Hey, hey, look, Stephen A., I just want to say this. Ever since the Super 6, where Andre Ward destroyed all the top fighters in the world, Easily, he's been the best pound-for-pound pound fighter. Now, let me just say this. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Whoa, 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 whoa. Let's stop right there. Hold, he's on. Been- hold it. Let's stop. I'm going to let you go on. Let's stop. Who was in the Super 6? And with Andre, Abraham, all the top fighters. Arthur was Abraham. The, with, Andre, Arthur, with Durrell. Hold on. Arthur, Arthur Abraham. Andre Durrell. Who else? All the time. It was some European, all the time fighters, though. But come, I got to get to the point real call quick. Frock, call Frock. I know that. But what I'm yeah, saying, is, I'm not rushing you. I'm just saying to you, those ain't exactly the greatest fighters in the world. He just, no, they was Stephen A. They, they were, were good. fighters that were undefeated. They, they were, were good. Undefeated. They were good. He destroyed. But Stephen A, he destroyed them. And the difference between him and Floyd, Floyd fought against Pacquiao. Not one time did he get in the pocket. Sweet Pete would at least get in the pocket and hit somebody and let them know I'm the champ. Floyd ran the whole time, and everybody picked on Pacquiao. Andre Ward doesn't do that. He fights like Bernard Hopkins when he wants to. Then he goes into a little bit of Sugar Ray when he wants to. He kind of blends it. He's been the best. Corey, stop, 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 because you're annoying me now. And this is why you're annoying me, Corey. This is why you're annoying me. Because I know you're right about the greatness of Andre Ward. I respect that. Nobody's nobody's dismissing that. But he ain't fighting no monster like Kovalev, though. Come on, bro. I mean, you talk, you're very, very dismissive of Kovalev. That's what I'm saying. You hear me, Corey? After the third round, Kovalev did not win a round. Where did you see he won six Corey, Corey, rounds Corey, Corey, at? Corey Corey, not- Corey, 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 you know what? I don't like you because you're not listening. You're busy talking, but you're not listening, bro. Yo, he didn't lose a, every round since the third. He lost every round since the sixth. I had Kovalev winning the first five, six rounds. The knockdown, Andre Ward did what he always does. He shuts Everybody down technically. Well, I picked them to win. In your head. That I picked them to win that fight. I picked them to win the last fight, Corey, and I'm picking them to win this fight. But don't act like Kovalev ain't something to be worried about. Y'all, y'all bit off the knockdown. What happened was y'all bit off the knockdown and then put the whole fight off the knockdown. He Hold did not win. He may have won Co- one Corey, 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 answer the question, okay? Now, a knockdown is two points, right? Yeah. Now, I had him winning the first five or six. I thought Kovalev won the fight by one point because I thought Andre Ward won the last six rounds. He won the last six rounds. Now, if you and I have a debate, what we're debating is the fifth and is the fourth and the fifth round because Kovalev first clearly won the first three and the second round was a two point round. So I had him winning the fight by one point. You acting like Andre Ward just dominated, Corey. I think the judges saw. See, for me, I've been seeing Andre Ward for He's years. He's a bad boy. I, know he did I love and Andre Ward. Austin, I, I know what he did. And uh, look, Percy Price is my my godfather. When he hit Ali, Ali went light heavyweight. So I'm from Captain June from the Jacksonville area. So I'm a boxing okay. connoisseur. Okay. So, so I know you know as far as fighting. When everybody was kind of over the top, I know the millennials don't really know, so they just kind of say anything. Ward was holding. Ward, Ward dominated him after that knockdown. It took a round or so for him to calibrate. 
to get out of that. But once Ward got out of that and felt his power, he dominated. Co- it surprised me because I didn't want him to fight Kovalev. I wanted him to fight Triple G to get that money. But he, he said, forget it. I'm going to fight Kovalev. So I said, hey, go ahead and fight Kovalev. But if it's anybody that I thought could beat Kovalev technically, it was Andre Ward. I got you. I appreciate it. I appreciate the point. And listen, I can't say you're wrong about what Andre Ward could potentially do because he clearly has the potential. I had him as the number two pound for pound fighter in the world behind Floyd Money Mayweather for years. And you're right about that. But you can't put Andre Ward number one when he wasn't even fighting. He was inactive because of all of those legal issues that he was having with his promoter. Andre Ward is class personified. He's a great guy and he's an absolutely great fighter. But the greatest of fighters fall to the likes of power like Kovalev possesses. So I'm picking Ward to win this fight, Corey, but I'm very worried about Ward, and I appreciate the call. Thanks so much. Marvin in Connecticut, you're live with Stephen A. What's up? Stephen, how you doing? How are you, Marvin? What's up, man? Thank you for calling. Good, good, good. I want your honest opinion, and I'm glad you took this call so late um, on the New York Yankees. Yes, sir. You think this team is going to fall apart with all these injuries and stuff going on? Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Is empty. Let, I got to admit to you, we're, we're, you're talking about injuries. You, you talk about the injuries. When you think injuries, you need to look at the New York Mets because I'm, I'm kind of wondering whether their strict and conditioning coach needs to be fired. I mean, my God, every time you turn around, somebody, Lagares, Harvey, everybody, Syndergaard, everybody's hurt with the, with the damn New York Mets. The Yankees going to have nicks and knacks here and there, but I think the power in their lineup, especially with Sanchez and Judge and those boys, I think they can sustain it. They're two and a half games in first place. I don't like the fact that they've lost three straight, but I got mad love and faith in the New York Yankees right now. I, I just believe that they can hold on. I don't like the fact that CeCe Sabathia is injured, but I believe in this team because I believe in this offense. Okay. Well, I, j- I just don't want the, the pressure to get off of Chapman. He needs to get off her. And, and, and just, you know, well, well, put on the gas. You know what? It's, interesting. Not out Let, of the it's interesting that you say that. Let me tell you something right now. They better damn well get Bryce Harper if they can get the opportunity to. I don't want to hear all of this stuff about Aaron Judge playing in the same field and right field. And because I got Aaron Judge, I don't need Bryce Harper. Hell with that. Have them both. If you can get them both, Brian, Marvin, get, get, get them both. Father's Day. Call Hal, call Randy. Get it together. Have a good day, Steven. All right, bro. Give Stephen A. a piece of your mind. He is sorry. Call him weekdays from 1 to 3 Eastern. I mean, just trash. At 866-729-3776. Guess what? You're in the middle of the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Damn it, I mean it. Ladies and gentlemen, with Father's Day approaching, I thought it was apropos that I read this to you. It's Father's Day, but it's obviously a day where You remember your parents and the things that they did for you and what they mean to you. We all know what my mother meant to me. There's a lot of kids out there that wish they had a dad that meant as much to them. Lonzo Ball doesn't have to wish about that. He has it with his dad. And for those of us who have been critics of LeVar Ball, I want to read to you a letter Lonzo Ball wrote to his father in the Players' Tribune for Father's Day. I'll read as much of it as I can before we get on out of here today. Quote, over the past few months, you've talked a lot about me, maybe more than some people cared for. So with Father's Day coming up, I thought that writing this would be a good way for me to actually say a few things about you, the real you not the person everyone has seen on TV, just my dad. One of the things I admire most about you is that you don't really care what other people think. People can have whatever opinions they want about who you are as a person, but they'll never have all the facts. They'll never know you like I do. They weren't there when you cleared out our living room so that my brothers and I would have room to play games and just be kids. They've never woken up to the smell of one of your signature breakfasts, which you made for us every single day when we were growing up. And they weren't there when you were making sure that I always took care of business in the classroom and that I graduated from high school with a 4.0 GPA. But you were. This probably won't surprise anybody. But for as long as I can remember, you've always been the loudest person in the gym. It didn't matter if you were coaching my team or sitting in the stands. I've always known you were watching me closely because I could always hear you. And that's how it's always been. You're not just present. You're involved. 
When I was in middle school, I started dreaming of one day making it to the NBA. I wanted to be a point guard just like Magic Johnson. You agreed to show me how to get there. You made your living training athletes. You still do. And so I put my trust in you. And in return, you made me put in that work. I still have your schedule ingrained in my mind. I probably always will. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, we did weights. Tuesday and Thursday, we did pull-ups. Then there was the hill. Oh, man, that hill. Every day, no matter what, you take Leangelo and Lamello and me around the corner from my house in Chino to run up and down that hill in the heat before bringing us back home to do sit-ups. You were always out there with us leading the way. You were there for every step, pushing, encouraging, and refusing to accept anything less than our very best. You never forced me to do any of it. You knew that you never needed to. You understood me. And when I did some need some motivation, you always knew just how to push my buttons. I wasn't it wasn't by making me do more reps or anything like that. It just came down to saying something simple like, I hope you know that you're not getting better. That was all I ever needed to hear from you to make me keep grinding. Regardless of what comes next in my life, I'm always going to remember our family road trips to games. It would be up front with mom, blasting music and getting my brothers and I hyped in the back seat. The ride to a game was always a party, but the mood on the ride home, well, that all depended on how the game had gone. You never told me great game and just left it at that. Win or lose, you've always been able to find something that I could improve. Some people are thrown off by your tone, but I've always known to internalize what you say rather than how you say it. Because when you unpack everything, there's always truth in what you tell me. I'll never forget the game we played against the travel team from New York a year, a few years back. They were all older than us, and we were completely outsized. I mean, Mello was probably a foot shorter than every single guy on that team. It was such a mismatch that I had to guard their power forward on defense. He goes on and on and on, raving about his father. And he ends it like this. You haven't had the easiest life. Everything you've got, you've had to work for. And you spent your entire adult life instilling that work ethic into me and my brothers to make sure that we never have to face the same challenges that you did. I can't think of anything else that you could ask for from a dad. Thank you for teaching me how to play this game. Thank you for teaching me how to be a man. And thank you for never apologizing for being you. Happy Father's Day, Dad. Love you. Lonzo. So as Father's Day approaches this weekend, and we give thanks to so many fathers out there, remember that while there's this penchant and there's this zest to criticize LeVar Ball, remember the man his son knows him to be. And be thankful for that. That's just a sample of what you'll hear on the Stephen A. Smith Show. Weekdays at 1 p.m. Eastern on Sirius XM Channel 80 and the ESPN app.